Raghu has been dealing with. Oh dear Raghu. Raghu, Dr. Raghu Sri Kumar, can you have your better slide please? Next slide. He is a pediatric hematologist. Raghu, can I have your better slide? The next slide. Hello. I'm going to the case presentation. Can I have your can I have a better slide? You haven't put a better slide on. Let let him self introduce. Yeah. Okay. Ah, uh, Madam Sami, point to what we have to do then. Yeah, Raghu. Anjali. Yeah, you are uh, the doctor Raghu. Good no, morning, Dr. Kumar. Good morning. Good morning. Is a pediatric amateur oncologist who is working Anjali. at the in Kolkata. Uh, he is has been in Astamet City initially, and then now he's been in Kolkata working at the uh, Tata uh, Medical Center in Kolkata, which is dealing with a lot of uh, pediatric oncology. uh over to you dr raku thank you sir thank you for this opportunity uh it is indeed a privilege to be here with uh, eminent uh, doctors like professor lee uh, dr nitisha and my dear friends and colleagues dr vivek and guru prasad so i will uh, begin today's session with uh, a case presentation about a 12 year old girl i will uh, go through her course of treatment and i will break in between to Uh, allow the speakers to discuss about various aspect of management of pediatric ALL. Malamai is saying that the book will get killed over. This child's story in the background. So, this is about a 12-year-old girl who presented to our institute with history of body ache and intermittent fever of a month's duration. She had history of bleeding from gums for almost a week. She was uh, treated symptomatically with analgesics. and finally reported to the hospital when uh, bleeding started from the lungs uh, she did not have any um, significant illness in the past apart from asthma for which she was on mdi prophylaxis and this uh, time get the uh, uh, growth and development were normal and she was attending school regularly immunization was up to date and there is nothing remarkable in her family history on examination she looked miserable she was febrile with vital stable vitals she looked pale she had bilateral cervical lymphadenopathy with the largest node being 3 to 3 cm there were no obvious dysmorphisms or neurocutaneous markers she had normal anthropometry for her age systemic examination uh, revealed uh, bleeding gums abdomen was soft she had hepatosplenum megaly other systems were normal on examination we started off with the basic investigations including the complete blood counts which showed leukocytosis with 47000 counts and a differential showing almost 80% percent atypical cells reported as blasts on the peripheral blood film peripheral count was low hemoglobin was 76 g percentage the um, uric acid was elevated with 9 mg um, per deciliter the liver function tests were normal the other um, tests were also basically were more or less normal Her chest X-ray was and ultrasound. Her chest X-ray was reported as normal. Ultrasound abdomen showed a perispinum megaly and a few enlarged mesenteric lymph nodes. So, how do we evaluate uh, this child further? And uh, this, the differential was that of acute leukemia. And then, how if it is uh, acute leukemia, which leukemia are we dealing with? And how do we risk? Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. I invite Dr. Yeah. Shiva and I request Dr. Jason to introduce him. So, Dr. Guru Prasad uh, will talk about the diagnosis and risk stratification because when you get a diagnosis, you know how to diagnose and what is how do you decide uh, which type of leukemia it is. And the risk stratification is very important at the, at the beginning of treatment. Uh, Dr. Guru Prasad, uh, yeah, share your slides, Guru Prasad, please. You are sharing it, Guru. Your share, your slide share is gone. And unmute yourself also, please. You you were sharing your slide, isn't it? And unmute yourself, please. Hmm? Okay. Can you uh, uh, your next slide, please? Hard to only two click. Guru Prasad has been working at the regional cancer yes. center after his completed his two click hard to only beta. Uh, I'm a tongue call, ji. Uh, your next slide, please, Guru Prasad. Make it, make it slide. Yeah, next slide. 
is the assistant professor of pediatric okay. oncology there next slide please now i'm going to start sir no, wait your next slide you, you i don't see your battery the slide um it's on now do you have your biodata slide yeah so guru prasad is done as uh, pediatric oncology uh, at the regional cancer center at trivandrum special interest is uh, critical care in neutropenic uh, children, uh, children and uh, pediatric uh, uh, um, stem cell trans transplant he is uh, uh, been the secretary of the iep kerala pho chapter and the president of the iep kerala pho chapter over to you uh, ruku for your presentation thank you uh, thank you sir for the introduction ruko i think the confusion still continues and so thank you ruko yeah okay uh, so request makes some of things easy for me uh, because you have a high in, in our child count so the possibility of leukemia is high in the list uh, so with that in background i will start off my uh, presentation so what i will basically be going through most of the things which we will be knowing already and i will try to give some new uh, information you... so uh, coming to any diagnosis the first point will be a clinical approach to it so uh, for diagno the clinical history of uh, looking uh, of a child with leukemia will include uh, various uh, pattern of presentation like uh, issues due to the general uh, issues like systemic effects of the disease medullary involvement plus a involvement the systemic effects include fever lassitude pallor and which are usually to appearance uh, released by the infection anemia or a combination of all this coming to marrow involvement anemia presence with pallor thrombocytopenia presence with bruise neutropenia presence with infection sepsis etc coming to the extramedullary involvement initially involved in before the system presenting with infection of the hepatosplenomy and mediastinal loss which can present with superior mediastinal syndrome superior vena cava syndrome or a simple respiratory distress coming to extramedullary involvement here being a disease of the blood it involves almost any any organ system in the body but there are certain organ system which are of clinical as well as prognostic significance the uh, cns tops in the list and the next one will be the test for involvement this the importance of these two system is that these two systems are protected from the uh, routine circulation by the blood brain barrier and the testicular barrier preventing hemolytic is reaching cytotoxic level in these organs thus giving its it, its prognostic significance cns involvement is present in less than 5% of leukemia presentation can present cranial involvement raised by ct testicular involvement usually presents with painless testicular enlargement or a, a loss in sensation that is over testicular involvement is present in less than 2% of presentation but an occult testicular involvement can be present in up to 1/3 of patients present and this is of what uh, the importance of this is that if you over diagnose testicular involvement uh, the is as we used to in the extra years and they will, uh, the survivors will become in, uh, have, will, will be having fertility issues in the future but with the current active chemotherapy protocols that are uh, available now the testicular involvement has lost its almost lost its prognostic significance cns involvement still holds its in, in, in uh, importance the role of cranial radiation uh, has come down we have seen but the role of radiation has come down by, by in the rapids or the therapy uh, by cn this is to be addressed so, uh, one of the complications is joint involved it's usually as bone pain and it's usually due to infiltration of periosteum bone infarction or expand medullary cavity the corresponding radiological features include uh, osteolytic uh, lesion transverse uh, radio and bands subcutaneous bone formation so there are some specific clinical presentation which will point towards a particular type of leukemia for example an adolescent boy with mediastinal mass hyperleukocytosis and a spontaneous tls usually points towards a t cell all 
in AML, a bleeding that is proportional to the platelet count. Please suggest you of presence. I think we've lost him. His uh, uh, internet connection is not correct. Uh, your internet connection. Guru, you have a problem with your internet. Sir, I'm connected. You need to talk to him. You need to call him and say that we have lost his link. Yeah. No, he's there. Am I back, sir? Am I back? No, your audio is breaking. Uh, what is your internet connection? Is it uh, oh, okay. uh, hotspot or your home? Geo, Geo, Geo. Why did you try your hotspot, mobile hotspot? Hello? Am I? No. Can you see me now? Yeah, you can see, but your uh, your. Uh, Voice is breaking, that's it. So can you see me now? Yeah, we can see you. Yeah, now it's clearer. Okay. Okay, okay. Uh, so we can present with tissue infiltration in the form of minor sarcoma and gum hypertrophy where the cell have a monocytic differentiation as seen in M4 and M5. Uh, So can I stop sharing and do once more? I think, I think so. so. Yeah, because it's, we are really can't either hear or can, can see you. Maybe log in again. hear you. Guru, let's hear. Make it uh, full screen. Can you hear me? can hear you, but your full screen is on. Make it full screen. Slide, uh, slide, slide show. I think his interconnection, internet connection is really poor. Yeah, your internet connection that's, is poor. That's the reason why it's taking very long time for the slides to be changed. I think this is going to be a problem. So can we have the next speaker and then he can set yeah. up again? And you, why don't you set up again by the time yeah. we can uh, have... We uh, can have a talk. Huh? Yeah. yeah. Can you stop sharing then? I, I, I think before he goes off, he, let him go off completely and log in again. That will probably help sometimes. Yeah. yeah. See, we have all uh, 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 some space left in the meeting room. So you can go out and come back again. Guru, stop sharing then. So uh, I think uh, Dr. Lee, uh, you can, I'll, I'll just, uh, uh, do you have a, your biodata slide, the second slide? Yeah. yeah. So we're going to talk, uh, we're going to have Dr. Chi Kong Lee, who is uh, the, uh, your full slide, your slide show, please. Now, Dr. Chi Kong Lee is the person that he's a lead consultant for today. He will also talk on the, uh, in addition to, so if Guru Prasad can't come back, he can talk a little bit about the diagnosis, about clinical features and uh, the uh, st uh, stress stratification. So he is the professor of pediatrics, uh, Department of Pediatrics at Chinese University of Hong Kong. 
He's the honorary consultant of the Hong Kong Children's Hospital and Prince of Wales Hospital. And uh, he's a director of special, subspecialty boards of Hong Kong College of Pediatrics. He's been the immediate past president of the Asia Continent International Pediatric Oncology Society, an executive member of the uh, International BFM Study Group. He's been on various study groups and he's done a lot of study on the various protocols in 2008, 2015, 2020. So he, he'll give you the latest on what is the treatment protocols for a, uh, acute lymphoplastic leukemia and it's uh, on the, for the collapses. What, what, what is, is the state of the art and what, what is done here in, all over the world today. Over to you, Dr. Chi Kong Lee. We were uh, so happy to have you. Dr. Bharat Agarwal was the person who, who connected us to Dr. Chi Kong Lee and he was so, so magnanimous to help us uh, he's here at 10.30 in the night and we're here till 12.15 uh, Hong Kong time. Thank you, Dr. Chikong Lee, for being with us. It's over to you. Dr. Lee, Dr. Lee. you're uh, unmuted. Unmute yourself. I can't see you on the screen. Dr. Lee okay. Another, another yeah. Person. Can you hear me now? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. Sorry, <laughs> I just forgot I'm mute. <laughs> and uh, uh, it is my great pleasure to uh, meet the friends from uh, India and also share uh, with some of our experience in the treatment of uh, acute lymphoplastic leukemia in children. And uh, actually, for the treatment of uh, uh, acute lymphoplastic leukemia, start uh, actually. Uh, 60, uh, 70 years ago, that uh, at that time, uh, Dr. Uh, Faber uh, started to use uh, those uh, anti-metabolites to uh, control the acute leukemia. But the uh, cure rate was actually, you can see, is still very low. Uh, that is from the uh, US Children's Oncology Group. But over the past few decades, you can see that the improvement of the survival to over 90% of uh, patients uh, surviving more than five years after the diagnosis. And similar kind of experience also uh, 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 happened in other parts of the world. In, so for example, in Hong Kong, in our previous uh, three to four decades of uh, clinical studies, we are seeing our improvement also appro approaching about 90% a chance of survival in our latest uh, 2008 study. Now, uh, I would like to share some of the uh, 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 current approach uh, on the chemotherapy, but actually these uh, chemotherapy uh, protocols are uh, actually staying, uh, are dating back to 90s, uh, having quite a standard approach, which is uh, still the backbone of the treatment uh, for uh, our patients now. And um, the firstly, we have to control the disease uh, with the uh, induction. The induction usually lasts for uh, four to five weeks. And uh, key agents usually in the induction, including weekly Winchristine, and then uh, aspirogenase, if it is the uh, E. coli native one, will be given uh, uh, six to nine doses, uh, uh, three, usually three times per week. And uh, also with about uh, four to five weeks of steroid. And for the steroid, they, there is a choice of either desamethasone or pedisolone. Now for the standard risk patients, uh, in some studies uh, like in the COG in US or uh, in the UK trials, they will only yeah. use three drugs induction. For uh, the high risk one, uh, donovan will be added. And, uh, but uh, the number uh, of times of giving donovan also varies uh, from two to four, four times, usually given as weekly. So this, is, this kind of induction protocol is quite standard among most of the uh, clinical studies nowadays. And uh, for many studies, they will in immediately after the induction will be given about three to four weeks of early intensification that will include one to two doses of cyclophosphamide at one gram per meter square. 
And then uh, Zytarabine or RRC will be given four times per week for two to four weeks together with uh, daily sex mercadopurine. And um, for the other uh, 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 higher risk patients, they will be having uh, the uh, aspirogenase or the uh, Winchristine added. Now, uh, that is the early phase, and then it will be followed by the consolidation phase. The consolidation phase, many centers are using high dose methotrexate. But what, what, what do we mean by high dose? It also varies. In some studies, they use uh, 2 gram or 2.5 gram or up to 5 gram. But in, in COG, they have another approach is using the escalating methotrexate. Start with 100 milligram intravenously up every 10 days with escalation of the dose to 50 milligram. So from 1 milli 100 milligram per meter square to 150 milligram per meter square to 200 milligram per meter square intravenously without folding the exit residue together with six microdopurine. Now this is the consolidation phase. And then nowadays it is now recognized the another very important component of the uh, chemotherapy is to give the re-induction or delay intensification. It, it is actually quite uh, uh, similar to the induction with the repeat of the induction phase. And uh, with uh, the four drugs together with the early intensification. Now, after finishing this uh, more intensive phase in the first six to nine months, the patient will be entering into the maintenance phase. The maintenance phase will be milder and it's a uh, uh, mainly given at home. So the patient will be having daily sex methotrexate, weekly methotrexate. Most people give oral methotrexate, but some center give intramuscular. Personally, I don't like the uh, injection. It's painful to the children. And the other uh, controversial issue is uh, to give the pulse uh, with Christine and steroid. That is every four weeks of uh, with Christine, adding on one dose of with Christine, or five to seven days of a steroid. Now, that has been quite debatable. Some, say, some studies showing that adding on the power steroid and uh, when Christine every four to eight weekly uh, have some improvement in the survival, reducing the relapse rate. While some studies saying that, oh, it is not really helpful, but introducing more side effects. Now, another very important uh, uh, element of treatment for acute lymphoblastic leukemia is the CNS preventive treatment or CNS directive treatment, or some this kind of uh, or, or some people call it prophylactic treatment. If we are not giving that, then there is more than fifty percent chance the patient will have a CNS relapse, usually after one year. Now, uh, St. Jude introduced the cranial irradiation. Uh, initially 24 gray, but then later on some centers like uh, BFM, they use a lower dose of 12 gray uh, as a CNS prophylaxis. It's actually very effective. So effective, it reduced the CNS relapse rate to less than 5%. However, with a long-term follow-up, we now uh, understand that this uh, irradiation is quite damaging. It actually causes a neural collective impairment and the quinopathies with growth hormone deficiency, uh, hypothyroidism, but more alarming is the second malignancy. We, are, we have seen patients uh, are cured of the ALL, but 10 years later, they died from the brain tumor like the glioblastoma multiforme. So this is uh, effective, but uh, too toxic. So people have now switched to the long radiation approach using the intrafecal chemotherapy. Uh, some, in some places, they use uh, methotrexate alone uh, but some places they believe uh, triple therapy, that is methotrexate together with cytarabine, hydrocortisone appears to be better. And there was also some randomized study performed and uh, some, uh, it is also controversial. The number of times of intrafecal given is usually at least 15 to up to 25 times over the whole course. Usually the more frequent injection of intrafecal in chemotherapy is during the first uh, uh, two to three months. And then the, um, the uh, number of, uh, or the, the intensity of intrafecal chemotherapy actually depends on the risk of relapse. For higher risk patients, like with high white cell count more than 100, 
T cell or infants, they have high risk of CNS relapse. So the more intensive intrathecal chemotherapy will be given uh, in the uh, first one to two months. However, we also understand that uh, other than intrathecal chemotherapy, other treatment like the systemic chemotherapy, which can cause the blood shrink barrier, can also uh, provide good uh, or effective CNS protection. For example, that's a method giving intravenously uh, or orally, that, that's a systemic, that's a method can cause the blood shrink barrier and uh, actually is quite effective in reducing the CNS relapse. But the desamethasone is also having more CNS side effects. And high dose methyl GC can also achieve a CNS uh, uh, effect and l aspartinase similarly. Now, uh, for the treatment intensity, usually we will uh, divide the patient into standard risk, uh, high risk, or some including intermediate risk. And how do we uh, classify these patients uh, uh, and uh, it depends on some biological features like the age, white cell, genetics. And now more important is the treatment response. Usually what we talk about early treatment response. In some places like the BFM studies uh, in the 80s and 90s, they give seven days of uh, steroid plus one dose of intrathecal methylgesate. And they assess the blast count on day eight. If it is less than one, then it is a called, called good uh, prednisone response. And in some other places, they consider looking at the peripheral blood is not reliable, but better look into the bone marrow because it is a bone marrow disease. Leukemia is a bone marrow disease. So they look at different time points up on the blast percentage. If it is more than 25%, it is a M3, 5 to 25% is a, a, a M2 and, and with such kind of classification. But these are not very sensitive because it rely on the morphology that is uh, according to the subjective uh, uh, examination by the uh, uh, pathologist. So nowadays people are using, trying to use more objective way is using the uh, minimal residual disease to uh, measure the minute amount of the leukemic cells. And uh, the most commonly uh, used method is either the real-time uh, qPCR or using the flow cytometry. Both are, have been shown to be quite uh, uh, comparable and uh, correlate very well. Now, this is uh, just an example showing one of the study uh, which we have participated called the ALICBFM 2002 uh, with uh, more than 5,000 patients uh, recruited over many countries. And uh, this is diagram showing this is uh, a, uh, uh, the induction and early uh, uh, intensification phase, and then followed by this consolidation phase, and then by the uh, re-induction or delay intensification followed by this uh, maintenance. Uh, but you can see that there are some randomization. For example, this one uh, re-induction with a longer duration versus two blocks of shorter duration of uh, uh, re-induction, which is less intensive, or with three times uh, so this is uh, the only way that we can confirm what is the best approach uh, to the uh, treatment uh, of these ALL patients. Depends on they, whether they are standard risk, so they will be treated less intensively. Intermediate risk, they will be more intensively treated. And for the high risk, they will be even treated with this so-called high risk block, very intensive, or some of them may be included into the stem cell transplant. I uh, noticed that we will have a colleague talking about the stem cell transplant uh, in the later part of this uh, presentation. Now, I, I think this is a BC table. I, I just, I'm not going into details, but just trying to show you that uh, in the mo most recent or currently ongoing trials, that uh, age, white cell count, uh, CNS3, that is uh, with the CNS disease diagnosis, they are all still considered as high risk that we have been using that for more than 20, 30 years. But nowadays people are more uh, uh, emphasizing on using a genetic basis. The high risk for some of BCL able happening in the Philadelphia chromosome. And uh, uh, the uh, other uh, uh, center, other countries like in this uh, all together in the European base, they also include uh, high uh, amplification of 21 hypodiploidy, that is chromosome less than 40 has been, or less than 44 has been uh, 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 confirmed to be very poor prognosis. Uh, that is on the uh, biological features that no one can change at the time they uh, uh, present. But the MRD response is something that may be altered by the treatment. 
So at different time points with different uh, uh, M mean low residual disease uh, uh, activities that will be indicating their uh, 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 risk of the relapse. The very high risk ones, they are usually requiring for the stem cell transplant. Now, after uh, treatment, uh, 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 trying to cure the disease, we also have to bear in mind that since we are now curing more and more patients, they have a long-term survivors. So our treatment is now also trying to avoid lazy credits. For example, at top aside, that has been used at one uh, period that uh, effectively reduced the leukemic load, but unfortunately, it will also cause a second malignancy. So they are not used in the non-high risk group. As I said, uh, cranial irradiation is damaging, so we are also not giving the cranial irradiation even uh, if the CNS disease is uh, uh, of the uh, CNS3. And also we try to limit the dose of the enzocycline, like the donorubicin or doxorubicin, try to reduce these uh, cardiac toxicity. So uh, other than chemotherapy, we are now also going into the era of using target therapy. Uh, for the most successful target therapy is the uh, imatinib. That is used in the Philadelphia chromosome, which is a thyroxine kinase inhibitor specific to the B cell able fusion products. US uh, COG uh, 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 10 years ago showing that it is uh, quite effective in reducing uh, 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 the chance of relapse, having uh, initially very good uh, three year event free survival, but later on, longer follow up actually showing a de decline in the event free survival to about 70%. But these are long stem cell transplant cases. And uh, another study we have participated is a European based called the ESPO study 2010, also using imatinib, uh, also uh, using minimal residual disease to monitor uh, for those who uh, are treated with imatinib together with chemotherapy. We are seeing a relapse rate not very high, 26%. However, we are observing there are quite a high uh, mortality from uh, complication, these are uh, infections. You can see that 26% uh, of a patient died a lot from the leukemia, uh, but mainly from, that is during the remission due to the infection. So uh, in this study, it also showed that uh, six, more than 60% of the patient did not require stem cell transplant to achieve long-term survival. Only a small percentage, uh, a smaller percentage requires stem cell transplant. Uh, this is the most uh, 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 recent study that is just published earlier this year. Uh, that is uh, comparing two different thyroxine kinase inhibitor. Imatinib is the first generation and desetinib is the second generation, uh, which is the only randomized controlled trial in the world that are uh, comparing uh, these two uh, TKI, and uh, uh, which is done by the uh, Chinese Children Cancer Group, uh, which uh, we also participate in this study, and showing that uh, that sedative arm um, at three to four years had a better event-free survival and overall survival because it reduced the rate of the relapse. But we still did a longer follow-up uh, to see the long-term effect. And how about relapse? Now, we still seeing some patient relapse. Now, for patients with relapse, and I, I think uh, there is uh, uh, some studies showing quite a uh, good result, that is uh, the UK uh, ALLR3 studies. Uh, they also have been trying to use uh, 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 different uh, uh, chemotherapy agents. For example, they test mitocentron versus either rubicin. You can see that the blue line, the uh, mitocentron, actually have a much better uh, progression-free survival as compared to either rubicin. And uh, so that is the result. I mean, in fact, this study tried to classify patients according to different risk groups, whether they are uh, so-called uh, high risk, uh, intermediate risk, or standard risk. So uh, for those uh, standard risk, they do not require transplant, just chemotherapy. And uh, for intermediate risk, it depends on the minimal residual disease. After induction, if it is low MRD, they will not require transplant. But high MRD, then they will go for stem cell transplant. So the target therapy is now getting more popular, uh, uh, trying to uh, target some high-risk patients. For example, one group is the Philadelphia-like ALL. They, especially those with uh, able gene mutation, they, uh, people have been trying to use the uh, uh, to improve the survival. 
Now, other uh, target therapy, including monoclonal antibody, uh, uh, specific to the leukemic uh, antigens, uh, in adults, they have been using rituximab because CD20 is more commonly positive in adult ALL. But now we have other uh, agents which is uh, really good for uh, childhood ALL. For example, CD19, CD22. These are very, very highly positive in uh, these uh, 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 childhood ALL. We have uh, these, uh, for example, in the which is uh, again the CD22 together with these uh, uh, catechomacin, uh, which enter into cells can kill the cells. And the other one is the bispec specific T cell engager. That is a uh, uh, binatumumab, which is uh, linking up the CD19 or uh, uh, torus against the uh, leukemic cells, and then link up the T cell with uh, CD3. So they have a bispecific, that is CD19 and CD3 antibody linking up so that the T cells can get close to the leukemic cells and kill the leukemic cells. And the most uh, 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 hot topic nowadays is about the CAR T. That is a chimeric antigen receptor. Actually, it's a ma genetically manipulated CD19 uh, T cells. As normally, the T cells do not express uh, CD19, but with the genetic manipulation, with the lentivirus uh, helping to insert the gene into the T cells, then it can recognize the CD19 uh, 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 antigen on the leukemic cells, and then the T cell will come in to kill the cells. Now, with these kind of new agents, actually, it also requires some studies uh, to confirm their efficacy. For example, in COG, they are doing a study randomizing uh, with binatumumab without binatumumab to see whether uh, they will be having a better outcome. They present. On binatumumab has less toxic effects and with a better uh, uh, survival with reduced uh, 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 relapse, so we still need to wait. And this is a diagram showing the uh, 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 CAR T principle that is, we get the cells from by plasma uh, leukophoresis to have the T cells and then the lentivirus with this uh, uh, bringing in the uh, uh, gene uh, coding for the uh, CD19 inserted into the T cells. And then after this expansion, uh, uh, manipulated cells will be infused into the body. And then when they come into contact with the leukemic cell, they will kill the cells at the, at the same time, stimulating these T cells to further expand so that they can survive a long time in the body. Now, other than chemotherapy treatment to kill the leukemic cells, we must never forget the supportive treatment, which is also very important uh, for control of the uh, leukemia. And this is uh, equally important as well. So. Uh, in summary, for the success of ALL treatment, we are seeing now about 90% of the patient can be cured. This is based on a large uh, uh, multi-center studies, either international or national study with large sample size to test the treatment hypothesis. And then also with a lot of research, then we can scientifically look into the genetic basis, pharmacogenetics and introduction of uh, target therapy. So our aim, our goal is try to reduce the early and late toxicity but achieving a high cure rate. So I, I think I, I, I have uh, 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 been completing my uh, presentation and uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Dr. Lee. It was, uh, you've just taken us to a different level with all your studies that you've done on the latest uh, therapies uh, in ALL. Uh, I, I'm sure we'll have a lot of questions at the end of the talk. I now request Dr. Raghu to continue sharing this, uh, his uh, case presentation. Raghu? Yes, sir. So that was a very enlightening uh, discussion by Dr. Uh, Lee. So unfortunately, Dr. Guru Prasad could not complete his uh, presentation on the diagnosis and the stratification. While you're talking, the, while you're doing this, uh, the case, you probably can talk about a little bit of it. About yeah, the I, I, will take, I will continue with the presentation, yeah. briefly touch upon what uh, Guru was supposed to do. Yeah. Uh, so at, from this point, once you have got the uh, baseline investigation, you know that you are dealing with uh, possibly an acute leukemia. 
So always the exam, the further lab investigation starts with a detailed examination of the peripheral blood film. And uh, in many cases, we can continue with the next level of investigation from the peripheral blood film, the peripheral blood itself. But often we recommend a bone marrow aspiration. And the major tests which are done at this point are flow cytometry or immunophenotyping as it is known as, which will characterize the cancer cells uh, in the blood and we, we can tell which is which, whether it is we are dealing with an ALL or an AML or which subtype of ALL we are dealing with. And then there are other tests like the karyotype uh, as well as the molecular uh, genetics of the blast cells, which will help us to risk stratify. Now with this cell as an example, uh, we went on with the bone marrow aspiration and uh, it was observed as a hypercellular bone marrow aspirate, which is often the case in case of a leukemia. And there were around 90 percentage uh, blast. And on the same sample, we did the flow cytometry, uh, which uh, helped us to cleanse the diagnosis. So if you look at the flow cytometry report here, you can see that the blast cells are expressing what is known as the CD10, the CD19, CD20 and CD79A. So uh, the expression of this particular type of immunophenotype on the blast cells will confirm the diagnosis that this cell is a precursor B cell ALL. Uh, the, this cell, these markers, the HLA, DR, and TDT will tell us that these are indeed uh, blast. So with this, we know the diagnosis is that of a precursor B cell, acute lymphoblastic leukemia. This patient also has an aberrant CD33 expression. And then we also looked at the karyotype of this patient. So she had a very complex uh, karyotype. She uh, also had what is known as hypodiploiding, which is a very poor prognostic marker in acute lymphoblastic leukemia. She also had an interesting feature. Uh, she had she was a near triploid. She was not exactly a triploid. Blood cells can show uh, triploidy, but this was not a true triploidy, which was evident from the DNA ploidy that we got from our flow cytometry test. This gave us an indication that we are dealing with a hypodiploid clone which has reduplicated. And uh, we also did the FIST studies, the fluorescent in situ hybridization studies to see what was happening. And we could find out multiple abnormalities like monosomy 15, monosomy 17, monosomy 7. And also we were able to confirm that there was an indoor reduplication of the hyperdiploid clone, which resulted in a low hyperdiploidy with near triploidy in this side. So our final diagnosis was that of B-cell acute lymphoblastic leukemia, high risk with a high risk because of her um, high counts as well as a low hypodiploidy or near triploidy. So this is a poor uh, prognostic factor and has to be managed like a high risk acute lymphoblastic leukemia. So the what, how to treat has been detailed um, in the discussion by uh, Professor Lee. So we proceeded with the treatment and uh, as per our protocol, there's a pre-phase steroid of around a week of steroids during which we assess the response uh, to steroids as well. Response to steroids is a good prognostic, uh, a, a good res response to the, the steroids is a good prognostic indicator. So that will also help us to risk stratify. Now, as soon as we started the preface steroid, we found that her leukocyte count crashed from 47,000 to 12,000. Her uric acid shot up to 14 milligram percentage, her potassium went up, her calcium dropped, her phosphorus went up and her creatinine remained the same. And along with this, while we are managing her uh, the, those symptoms, the, those issues, she also became febrile. She had fever with seals. She became hypotensive. We had to resuscitate her with fluid bolus and inotropes and shift to the ICU. She became tachypneic. She desaturated. She had bilateral pneumonia. She required ventilation, and she was on ventilator support for almost a week. Finally, she could be weaned off. So the issues that we are dealing with in this child are too common emergencies which we see in the management of acute lymphoblastic leukemia. One is tumor lysis syndrome and next is neutropenic sepsis in a child with on induction therapy for BALL. So I invite uh, the next speaker, uh, Dr. Nitin Shah to discuss about some of the acute emergencies in the management of acute lymphoblastic leukemia. I request Dr. Jason to introduce uh, Nitin sir to the audience. Uh Thank you so much, for, uh, Raghu, for that presentation. 
I now have to. I don't think that the Dr. Nitin Shah requires any introduction in India. He's been the past president of the Indian Academy of Pediatrics. He was going to talk about a few of the acute complications of acute lymphoblastic leukemia that this child has gone through. His child has gone through a lot of uh, complications, which uh, I don't think he'll be able to do all the complications. He'll do mainly two. He is a section head of pediatrics at PD Hindu Hindutva Hospital at Mumbai. He's on the pediatric hematology oncologist at BJ Wardia Hospital, one of the biggest hospital in uh, Mumbai, and a visiting pediatric hematologist at Apollo Hospital. He's uh, the chairperson of the IAP uh, uh, PHO chapter 2015 to 16 is edited various books. Uh, the publication list will go on for pages, so it's impossible to go through the whole, all, all his um, credentials. I invite Dr. Nitin Shah to talk on complications of AL. Over to you, Nitin. Yeah, thanks, Jason. Thanks, the fellow colleagues, Dr. Lee, and all the students who have taken out time at night today to listen to the story of everything about ALL. These are the two uh, institutes uh, which have really taught me a lot. That's the BJ Wadia Hospital for Children, which now is a heritage structure by, by government regulation. And this is PD Hinduja National Hospital, which is one of the earliest uh, tertiary care hospital in the city of Mumbai. Uh, when you man ma manage a patient of leukemia, or for that matter, any malignancy, but generally liquid malignancy because the tumor load is much higher in, in uh, liquid malignancies, so you, you have tumor lysis, like Dr. Regu said, his patient had. Uh, you can have a patient of lymphoma uh, with a mediastinal mass pressing on the nearby structure, coming with what you call superior vinicola syndrome. This is a real emergency because you can lose the patient if you are not very careful. Febrile neutropenia would keep on happening throughout the induction, uh, maintenance, I mean, reinduction, late intensification, those phase. Sometimes even during maintenance, you can have a patient coming with low count and fever. There are other complications that you can uh, find, you can have. So if you have been uh, reckless with your fluid therapy in an anemic child, you can push him into failure. Child can come with bleeding either because of low platelet or associated DIC, which is more common in AML, but it can also happen in ALL with sepsis. Hyperleukocytosis itself can lead to a CNS problem and a secondary tumor lysis. If you have uh, not been careful, especially in transplant setting, you can have a transfusion associated GBHD. You can have fractures in a child with uh, uh, malignancy. You can have cord compression in malignancy. You can have GI like severe tiflitis because of neutropenia. You can have CNS because of either seizures following drugs, complications because of the intrathecal methotrexate, aseptic or actual pyogenic infections, and so on and so forth. And you can have an acute cardiac uh, toxicity following your use of anthracyclines. So this list is endless, and I'm, of course, not going to discuss all this because I just have 15 minutes. So I have selected exactly the two complications that the previous child uh, that was discussed as a case presentation had, and that is tumor lysis syndrome and febrile neutropenia. So let me touch upon the first. Tumor lysis syndrome, by definition, is a metabolic derangement that occurs due to rapid breakdown of tumor cells. Now remember, tumor cells can undergo uh, uh, apoptosis on their own even before chemotherapy and that can lead to a tumor lysis to start with or you can mainly have tum tumor lysis following therapy like this child was started on therapy and he went into tumor or she went into tumor lysis so what happens when the blast cells die they will release intracellular substances especially ions which are potassium because you know intracellular potassium ion is very high as compared to extracellular the nucleic acid, so the metabolites of nucleic acid, namely uh, the problem of uric acid, and it also releases a lot of proteins. So by definition, tumor lysis would mean a tetrad of hyperuricemia, hyperkalemia, hyperphosphatemia, and hypocalcemia. And you all of this can lead to fatal complication, especially uricemia and phosphatemia can lead to acute renal shutdown uh, and uh, hyperkalemia can lead to fatal arrhythmia. So you have to be very careful while treating this patient in the initial two to three weeks of stage. And remember, you may have a child who has been started on chemotherapy. One week, there may be nothing and suddenly may go into tumor lysis a little late. So remember, you have to be very careful. Which are the malignancies which are more prone for tumor lysis? T-cell ALL because they come with more tumor load. They come with very high WBC count and also many of them present with mediastinal mass. Lymphomas because the mass is so big that they can have. 
and third and most important is b cell malignancies of course we are discussing today acute all which is a precursor b cell malignancy but if you have a mature b cell malignancy like a burkitt leukemia or a burkitt lymphoma then you should be very careful because tumor lysis is generally a norm in this patient unless you are careful it can be either a clinical or lab so many time when you treat alls who come with huge lymph nodes and liver spleen you will have a lab evidence of tumor lysis but not necessarily all of them are into clinical in the which means that they have a organ dysfunction but when because of the lab abnormality there is also a clinical manifestation in the form of organ dysfunction renal shutdown hyperkalemia leading to arrhythmias etc it becomes a clinical which is even more uh, uh, worse and more you should be alert about <coughs> so when you call it tls lab tls is where you have two or more of the following which is uric acid more than 8 mg or a rise of 25% over baseline serum potassium more than 6 or same more than 25% raise over baseline phosphorus more than 6.5 calcium below 7 each one having more than 24% rise or for calcium a drop over the baseline and when this leads to one of the following either in the form of renal failure with a creatinine jumping to more than 1.5 times the upper normal limits and especially patient has other manifestation like seizure arrhythmia oliguria puffiness which are signs of renal failure uh, or sometime a sudden death which may happen because of the tumor lysis there are scoring system and the grading of tumor lysis i won't go in detail because lack of time they are all available online which you may use in your clinical practice so let's discuss the tetrad first is uric acid purine nucleic acids are converted to hypoxanthin hypoxanthin is converted to xanthin and xanthin is converted to uric acid as humans lack uric oxidase uric acid is the last part of the metabolism of this purine nucleic acid so when there is limited renal capacity to clear the load excess urine urate crystals will precipitate in the urine in the distal tubule or in the collecting tubule especially in an acidic medium and they will lead to renal failure it will be worsened when the patient is also dehydrated that's why rehydration is very important in all malignancy patient in the first few days drugs that you use which are nephrotoxic or other mechanisms you can also have an obstructive uropathy whereby this crystals actually block the ureters they may have oliguria they will come with gi while vomiting loose motion etc and that will worsen the dehydration and hyperuricemia hyperkalemia normally we know intracellular potassium levels are very high as compared to extracellular levels so when this blast break the first thing they release is potassium and kidneys have a limited capacity to excrete potassium so when this capacity is exceeded it will lead to hyperkalemia which will lead to uh, nausea vomiting neuromuscular symptom like muscle weakness cramps fatigue and paresthesias the more important are the cardiac so you will have ecg changes asystole vtac vfib and a sudden death so ekg monitoring is really very important in a patient especially at baseline and after you start the therapy to do the repeat ekg if you are suspecting that the potassium levels are going above 5 don't wait till 6.5 when this above 5 you should be careful about monitoring very closely hyperphosphatemia and hypocalcemia almost go hand in hand so again malignant cells are four time more phosphates than a normal cell so kidneys again have a limited capacity to excrete phosphate how does it do it increases excretion by increasing glomerular filtration and it decreases the tubular reabsorption especially in the proximal renal tubules which will help to maintain phosphate level till some time but when the load becomes more than what the kidneys can uh, compensate for there will be phosphates in the urine which again will tend to crystallize and lead to a uh, 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 phosphate uh, crystals so you also have hyperuricemia in most of these patients so you have double whammy uric acid nephropathy and now phosphate adding to the damage which lead to ultimately a renal shutdown so they will again present with nausea vomiting they may have tissue calcification and remember when there is high phosphates uh, not only they precipitate but they will precipitate with calcium and not only in the kidney but also sometime in muscle and tissues so it will lead to secondary hypocalcemia and normally patient will come with agitation cramps tetany or cardiac arrhythmia when they develop hypocalcemia so phosphates and calcium many time go hand in hand so 
Ultimately, all of them will lead to uremia because of uric acid or a phosphate calcium precipitating, uh, crystal precipitating in the uh, renal tubules, leading to acute renal shutdown. As I said, there may be also an additional obstructive uropathy. Ob obviously, if there is a lymphoma like picture and a lymph node is pressing on the ureter, it will also lead to mechanical uh, obstructive uropathy add to the crystals of the uric acid and phosphate. So, they will come with nausea, vomiting, lethargy, oliguria, anuria acidosis, huffiness, hypertension, and drowsiness. So these are the signs and symptoms which you should be uh, monitoring to suggest that patient's creatine is going up and you need to do something about that. Uh, if there is obstructive uropathy, then they'll come with flank pain, hematuria. Ultimately, they may go into uremic encephalopathy. They may have bleeding because of the platelet dysfunction. They may have convulsions and they may become comatose if you are not uh, uh, detecting them in time and treating them in time. So how do you manage anticipation? And I think that's the most important word. You anticipate tumor lysis in every malignancy, especially if the tumor load is high. Now, how do you know tumor load? Presenting WBC count, T cell and uh, Burkitt's lymphoma more common and huge organomegaly. So you have huge liver, huge spleen, and large lymph node. These are the patients which are likely to go into tumor lysis. Then look for clinical signs and urine output. Extremely important to monitor urine output on hourly basis in ICU and at least every four to six hourly basis in your ward patient who are stable. You do a baseline LDH, baseline uric acid, baseline phosphorus, calcium, PUN, creatinine, erectolytes, and a baseline EKG and a cardiac monitoring. And then once you can institute your chemotherapy, you repeat it every four, six, eight hours based on the patient's clinical condition. And remember, a delayed tumor lysis also is known in some of the patients. Hydration is very important as tolerated based on the baseline hemoglobin. So in a patient who comes with 3 and 4 gram hemoglobin, don't start straight 3 liter per square meter. You will push the patient to congestive cardiac failure. But a child who has come with 8 or 9 gram or a child who has come with anemia, you are building up by giving a praxial transfusion over 12 to 24 hours. You can in uh, over the time, increase your fluid from maintenance to 2 liters to 3 liters per square meter. Ultimately, you can go up to 3, even 4 liters per square meter if the patient is tolerating of normal saline. Remember, don't add potassium where the potassium is going to be high. When you give very high fluid, generally you prefer an isotonic solution. So it's good to give NS instead of giving 0.5 NS. And certainly, you can't give so much of dextrose containing fluid. So you have to, if the patient is nil by mouth, then you'll have to calculate maintenance as DNS and rest all extra fluid as NS. You have to maintain urine, uh, major urine output every six hours. It should match two, at least two thirds of the previous six hours input. If not, then probably the patient will go into fluid overload. So you will have to, that will be also seen by intact output mismatch and a weight which is going up. Don't hesitate to give them frusimide as required to maintain urine output or decrease your fluids if the patient is going into acute renal shutdown. Alkalinization, which was tried in fast for uric acid, is no more recommended because you have to very tightly maintain between 7 and 8. In acidic uh, uh, urine, the uric acid tends to uh, uh, crystallize. In an alkaline urine, the phosphates tend to crystallize. So now hydration is more important than alkalinization. Drugs, yes, go slow on chemotherapy. If the patient has come with 5 like WBC, I will start with low-dose steroid and go up over 2-3 days. By, by the time I have also instituted the uh, allopurinol, maybe raspberries, and hydrated well so that I can go slow on the steroids. Hydrate well for two to three days before chemotherapy. Remember, chemotherapy is never an urgent treatment in a leukemia. Stabilization of the patient, treating his anemia, treating his bleeding, treating his sepsis, get a precedence over starting chemotherapy. So never transfer in an urgent way to start chemotherapy. Allopurinol, 300 milligrams per square meter per day in two divided doses. Raspberries is very important for patients who come with high tumor load and for Burkitt's lymphoma and for T cell malignancy with a huge lymphoma. Uh, upfront, don't wait till the patient deteriorates. 0.15 to 0.2 mg per kg, a slow infusion over 30 minutes. You can repeat a dose after uh, 12 to 24 hours or 48 hours, but generally the first dose is the most important. Remember, raspberries can lead to hemolysis. G6PD is must before raspberries because you can't give it in G6PD deficient patients. If you have given a very fast, anaphylaxis is known, methemoglobinemia. In past, the cost used to be very high. Uh, it used to cost 30, 40,000 rupees. But now with the Indian generic uh, coming through, the cost has fallen to almost Indian 8 to 9,000 rupees.
per vial of raspberry case so it is easily available and uh, uh, what it does is it converts urate to allo allantoin which is highly urinary soluble and excretable so you are preventing uric acid nephropathy basically uh, you uh, your hyperkalemia stop all potassium if you have been giving it salbutamol nebulization which will help immediate uh, measure to prevent cardiac toxicity soda bicarb and iv calcium as required glucose insulin drip if doesn't help potassium binders and lastly if we, if the potassium shield is very high don't wait and just dialyze the patient hypophosphatemia generally gets corrected with hydration alone you may use aluminum hydroxide but generally is not required hypocalcemia treat only if the patient is having symptomatic tetany or convulsions because if you give a lot of potassium with high phosphate all you will do is lead to more and more uh, uh, phosphate calcium binding and crystallization and maybe even tissue calcification and nephrocalcinosis rather than trying to help so only if the patient is symptomatic give iv calcium dialysis if all this fails yes dialysis would be required uric acid more than 12 phosphate more than 12 potassium more than 7 maybe an urgent need to a uh, dialysis is a patient not responding to hydration alone severe metabolic acidosis water intoxication and anuria are some other reasons why you may need dialysis but remember there are no cutoffs for urgent dialysis always is first hydration and the drugs and if that fails then you can go to dialysis uh, a word about superior vena cava syndrome a patient coming with a massive mediastinal mass it can press on the esophagus and on the trachea and on the vasculature so the patient will come with brassy cough which worsens on lying down patient may have dyspnea with stridor and can have dysphagia patient is extremely uncomfortable lying down so he typically wants to sit and whole night he he sleeps with sitting on a cardiac bed type of stool which if you are given suffuse phase puffiness anxious look because of hypoxia dilated veins over the upper chest these are the signs the that sign you should not miss avoid sedation in this patient because once you sedate his respiratory muscles will give up and he can choke to death always prop the position intubate electively if you have to do a procedure under sedation because once you sedate him the mass may press so much that you will not you will have a very difficult uh, uh, intubation ultrasound sound guided biopsy in a sitting position are better than a lying down position sitting guided biopsy especially in an older child and remember this patient are also prone to tumor lysis syndrome so remember to uh, be be ready for that you can reduce the mass if it is symptomatic by quickly obtaining a biopsy material for your diagnosis and then treat with steroids and or one dose of cyclophosphamide okay febrile neutropenia you may lose a patient of febrile neutropenia even in the best centers the mortality may be up to 1% in the induction uh, because of bleeding or a fever or a sepsis so when the patient has fever of more than 38.3 degree Uh, 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 for a uh, single spike or more than 38 degree for one hour especially when no blood products are given in the last 6 hours and patient didn't have a reaction to iv fluid and the patient's ans is below 500 that is critical level or is below 1000 but is likely to predict to fall very fast because of your recent chemotherapy then this child fits into febrile neutropenia now why are you worried because 50% of this febrile neutropenia episodes are likely to be infection most of them are bacterial and remember when is bacterial the organism comes from the patient's own flora so it is important to know your own local flora and the patient's past history of febrile neutropenia to take call on which will be your first line of treatment because if you read the books it will give you first line second line third line antibiotic but if you have had a massive mrsa outbreak in your in your in your uh, hospital then you will be really using vanco more often than in a normal uh, circumstances and so on and so forth if you have a very high incidence of esbl producers if you have very high incidence of say uh, 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 a a very blood drug resistant uh, pseudomonas then you know your your you have a cre which has been a major problem in your uh, institute in the last few months then you will really upfront start antibody which are so called higher antibiotic instead of waiting because the patient may die in 24 hours and uh, so what do you do you do a cbc of course a peripheral smear a crp and a procalcitonin which are very important to tell you and even on follow up prognostication urine routine is must culture if you are suspecting a urine tract infection x ray chest and other x ray as required a set of blood culture from peripheral and if you have a central line like a port or a hickman's catheter then from each port uh, line you take cultures 
and other culture like suppose someone has come with perennial uh, abscess like or you have a obviously ivy side abscess then take a culture from that local area and in some cases you may have to do an early imaging like ultrasound for tiflitis or uh, abdominal distension or a ct chest if you are suspecting aspergillosis based on your past experience first line if your patient has come with septic shock first one hour golden hour to first give first dose of antibiotic very important if the patient not in septic shock then you can uh, uh, i mean you, uh, you try to institute antibiotic as early as possible in busy hospital to get a bed may be difficult so you can take the patient to casualty insert your lines and start the antibiotic there and then and then shift to the wards whenever the bed is available this is one indication where a broad spectrum antibiotics are recommended normally pediatricians and everyone talks about narrow spectrum give as less as possible give first line as much as possible etc but that is not true in a sick patient of febrile neutropenia so you cover gram positive and gram negative both so you can use ceftriaxone and amikacin if your your hospital has been not having esbl a producer if you have esbl producer which is a norm then you will use probably piptaz and amikacin as your first choice you can even use meropenem as first choice if you had a patient which are resistant to even uh, esbl producers uh, you if you have a port or a central line or a patient is known to have mrs in past or patient has come with septic shock with hypotension or has mucositis these are the reasons where there may be a breach in the uh, skin or patient is already colonized in past vanco upfront is a must and you can always drop it if you grow something else which is or you grow a staph which is sensitive to your uh, uh, cloxacillin or uh, uh, oxacillin in a stable patient you wait there is no need to change the antibiotic just because the fever is not going down you can wait even up to 5 days up to 7 days in a very stable patient if a patient not stable then at 40 to 72 hours you take a call you have grown something you switch your antibiotic as per your culture sensitivity if you not grown something then you take a set fresh set of culture and now you change your antibiotics so if you are giving ceftriaxone add piptazo if you are using piptazo make it meropenem if you not given vancomycin add vancomycin and so on and so forth question come when do you add antifungal uh, empirically in a all you can wait up to 5 days 7 days but in aml remember you should use it as early as even maybe day 3 or day 4 uh, based on your past experience so how long you give patient is afebrile ans is more than 500 for 2 to 3 days you can stop the antibiotic observe for 48 hours and discharge the patient uh, if the culture is proven based on the organism you may have to give it for 10 to 14 days uh, antifungals till two cultures are negative or 14 days whichever is later so you go a little longer especially for candidemia uh, if you have grown we will come to antifungal little later use gcsf not in induction because induction it will not help but in the post induction second third fourth cycle gcc will really help you to recover the marrow and maybe your days to hospitalization may come down it may not have an impact on the ultimate outcome but your hospital stay will come down uh, don't forget that everything is not bacterial in the current season you may be flu it may be covid it may be herpes so you treat accordingly don't forget about your pcp especially in an infant will like infant all if i stop your pcp prophylaxis because of the count being low and the patient has tachypnea always do a ball and see whether it's pcp and so on and so forth uh, removal of the central line is something which uh, we needs merit and i'll discuss it at the last slide something about antifungal empirical antifungals are justified in all with febrile neutropenia after second gen of antibiotics are not helping so say day 5 day 2 to, to day 7 or you have an obvious focus like you are seeing some shadows in the lung and you have done a ct or you done a ct up front and you see a uh, perivascular cuffing then that's like aspergillosis or you are grown on your blood culture candida then you know patient has got candidiasis and so on and so forth so you can use liposomal ampho b or casco depending upon your choice now the costs are casco has gone down so you could use either of them if you have a specific organism or a suspicion you target it if you have candidiasis initially you may use ampho but then you can switch to fluconazole uh, maybe by one week or second week Uh, except for cruzi and glabrata where it will not work uh, where you will use ampho and casco you can use mica fungin or anadula fungin all of them are good choice as a first line if you have aspergillosis then voriconazole is the drug of choice and not fluconazole if you are suspecting mucus so you have some 
tissue damage, necrosis, you have palatal ulcers, you have necrosis of palate, or you have a, something like a sinusitis which is showing you a damage there, then you suspect mucor, quickly take a swab and a culture and you grow something and you see it under your microscope, switch over to M4B as little as possible. And you give it for at least three weeks, if not more, and then step down to oral coseconazole, which may go on for months, like for three months, six months, depending upon how uh, uh, how the patient is showing response. Don't forget that it is not only antifungal, but a vigorous and a wide surgical debridement, which is very important because unless you remove the source, the fungus will keep on coming back. So based on the species for the other fungus, you always take a consult of an infection disease specialist to decide upon what treatment to give. Uh, duration, invasive candidiasis till two weeks after the clinical uh, response and the site improvement and also two cultures, 48 to 72 hours apart are negative. For hepatitis only candidiasis, which is like the chronic phase, which we, you may see in some patient, you give till lesions disappear. And we have seen sometimes lesions take six months to one year to disappear. They normally come with very high fever and you don't find a focus. And you have those typical target lesion on your ultrasound or your on, on your imaging either in the liver or spleen or in the kidney. So it is hepatosplenic or renal candidiasis. Aspergillosis, you give for six to 12 weeks till lesions have healed. For mucor, as I said, six weeks till lesions have healed or for CNS mucor, you may use it even up to six months. Prophylaxis, I don't prefer primary prophylaxis at all because if you use proconazole prophylaxis, you induce a aspergillus. If you use voriconazole prophylaxis, you may induce a mucor. So I usually use a, as a secondary prophylaxis, someone who had invasive candidiasis in past, and you are giving good subsequent high chemotherapy, you, you can continue a fluconazole. For your chronic candidiasis, you continue fluconazole. For aspergillosis, again, for a very massive chemotherapy, you may give a, uh, a voriconazole prophylaxis. But beyond that, generally, AMLs are the ones where you give a lot of prophylaxis, not in ALM. Other therapies, IVIG, sometimes you may have to use if you are suspecting some immune fevers, uh, GCSF, liberal use, granulocyte. Once upon a darling of a treatment, now with the GCSF, we don't treat. But as I said, in induction, you GCSF, you don't use because it's not going to work because the marrow is full of blast. So if you are pushed to the wall, you are given antibiotic, you are given everything. Patient is very sick and is not coming out of ICU. You may try granulocyte transfusion one or two, and you may tie it over the crisis till the patient's ANC recovers. Uh, last slide, removal of central line. Uh, remember, your source of infection may be a central line. How do you know? The source is central and not generalized infection. So if you have periportal infection, you can see it. Your tunnel infection for a, a pick line, you can see it. If there's no response in, uh, response in spite of adequate antibiotics, you suspect. When you have a patient coming with a shock, hypotension, you suspect. You have septic embolization, like say in CNS or somewhere else, you suspect. A catheter which is blocked, so you say sister tells you that sir, the forward flow is not there, the backward flow is not there, you suspect that's the cause. Remember, a central line getting infected alone or earlier than your peripheral culture tells you that the source is central line. If your peripheral culture grows before central line or only peripheral cultures grow, then generalized sepsis, you don't have to worry about central line. Uh, if you have certain infection like MAI, Fungal, like Candida, Bacillus, Pseudomonas, these are usually because the lines have got infected and probably if you have a block line, you would be able, you, you should remove it. Uh, you are able to salvage a lot of central line by using what we call antibiotic lock along with heparin and best is to take a consult with your infection disease specialist, which line to salvage, which not to salvage. Generally, a fungal infection lines are very difficult to salvage but a bacterial infection you are able to salvage. And when you are uh, salvaging a line, your antibiotics you give through the portals of the central line, but your fluids and et cetera, use a separate peripheral line so that you don't use the line except for lock. So you lock a line, you open it for antibiotics, after your antibiotics are again lock the line, and you try for two weeks of lock. At the end of two weeks, the patient is okay. You take fresh culture, they are negative. You can use the line again for the uh, future chemotherapy. So, so remember, besides treatment, it is the prevention of fibrinol neutropenia, which is equally important. So aseptic precaution, I cannot stress upon more about aseptic precaution than in a patient of malignancy. Chlorhexidine mouthwash after major meals because the common source is periodontitis, which leads to infection. Chlorhexidine bath, difficult to get nowadays because of the COVID problem, but 
which was very regular in past. You can do betadine gargles. Uh, you can do betadine to the loins and the groins if you are suspecting a, a, a chap skin there. Only mineral water is what we say to our patients because the hygiene is very poor and the water supply is extremely poor in our country. Hand sanitization, hand sanitization, and hand sanitization. Not only in COVID, but also in leukemic patient before touching their patient. You touch the patient also, you should wash. I always tell all my little fellows that when I come to you and if you see me touching you without sanitizing my hand, you tell doctor, wait, you have not sanitized your hand. I will not feel offended because sometime in a hurry, we also tend to forget. Sterile diet, well-cooked food, avoiding open food, avoiding uh, unsterile, especially in our country, fruits, chutneys, uh, all those, uh, you know, it's very difficult to give. Question that is asked about non-veg food. So I always say that you can use cooked food at home, especially when the patient counts are okay. But otherwise, open food and brought from outside, avoid because you never know the hygiene there. Avoiding the crowd, no schooling in, during the first eight or nine months when they are on intense phase, we also go in a long way in preventing a lot of infection. So we put a board outside the patient's room that no visitors allowed. When you do that, because in India, it's typical that a child is sick, 10 people want to come and meet him. So I think that's what something we should avoid. So, and don't forget not to give any vaccine because not only they will not work during induction, but they will do to harm if you give oral polio or live vaccine because that can lead to a lot of uh, vaccine-induced paralysis or vaccine-induced illness. So in a nutshell, in the if I have to show you in a photographic way, then putting no visitors board and putting masks, etc. outside, hand washing by doctors, very important. People don't do it. They have full slide, full sleeve, cuffs are there, and they do just courtesy hand wash. That's not correct. Okay, keep all these materials for disposable ready. You have this betadine uh, mineral water, make them gargle, give bath, sterile diet, sterile clothes, and for the family members also, they must sanitize the hand before. And when you sanitize the hand, you take at least 5 ml and use all the six steps that you use, six or seven steps. And the, the sanitizer has to evaporate from a hand before you touch. So it's not, you cannot just take a little rub here, there and start touching because 30 seconds is required for it to be in contact to kill bacteria or viruses. Uh, remember, you may be pushed to the wall treating onco patient many times in your life. This is a picture put by the brother of a very sick Burkitt leukemia where I thought I would lose the child. And looking at my face, next day he had put this, that he was a 10-year-old brother of the child, that this is my motto not to give up. He was telling me, doctor, don't give up. And believe me, the child survived. And I have put this in my uh, memory that never give up in an onco patient because miracles happen sometimes in a very sick child. And your young patients treat, teach you as your teachers because every time a patient comes with something different from what is given in the books, you have to open your literature and read it. And mind you, it is fascinating journey when you treat these leukemic children. Thank you very much for your patient here. Thank you so much, Dr. Nitin. That is a very, very elaborate talk on complications of uh, ALL. We will uh, uh, go on to the... Um, next topic and that is uh, uh, the bone marrow transplant but I don't think we'll have Guru, we have enough time for Guru Prasad to come back we will have uh, something on bone marrow transplant Raghu Hello Guru okay, sir, we'll go back to the uh, presentation now yeah So we had a very uh, detailed discussion uh, by Dr. Nidin Shah on how to manage acute complications in acute lipoblastic leukemia. So we'll proceed with the case. So this child went on to finish her intense phase of treatment and followed by the maintenance therapy, two years of maintenance ther therapy. And uh, unfortunately, two months after completion of treatment, she presented with back pain. Peripheral blood smear showed a count of 30,000 with 40 percentage plus. So what to do next? For this, I invite Dr. Vivek Radhakrishnan to discuss the role of HSCT in pediatric ALL. Uh, Dr. Jason, could you introduce uh, Dr. Vivek to the audience? Well, uh, can you stop sharing your screen? Well, Dr. Vivek is also a uh, person who's been with uh, us at Aston City quite some time. 
and then uh, uh, he also with uh, Raghu, two of them left to uh, join um, Maman Chandi at uh, the uh, institute in Bombay in, in Kolkata, which is the data center. So Dr. Vivek is an, he's been the head of the transplant division there, and uh, he's done uh, this. Uh, this is Dr. Vivek for you. He's a uh, senior consultant in the clinical hematology department. Uh, he's um, program director of the hemopoietic cell transplantation there. He's the convener of the immuno oncology working group of the uh, Tata Medical Center. And uh, he's the principal investigator at Tata Precision Oncology Project. Data Trust and a course director of NBE, that is DNB programs in the TMC. The Joint Secretary of the Immuno Oncology Society of India. Uh, I'd request Dr. Uh, Raghu to uh, discuss this with uh, Dr. Vivek. Thank you, Dr. Jason, for your kind introduction. Um, my brief today is to speak on um, the role of allogenic bone marrow transplantation in childhood acute lymphoplastic leukemia. So this is in a question answer format that Dr. Raghu has designed. So we we'll, uh, discuss it uh, one question at a time. Yes, Dr. Raghu, you can carry on. Yeah, sorry. Uh, welcome, uh, Dr. Vivek. So uh, we will go ahead with the case discussion. Uh, you have heard about uh, the, this child who had a very early medullary relapse of leukemia. She was uh, a low hyperdiploidy to start with, which itself is a poor risk factor. Now, in this situation, uh, what would you uh, recommend for this child? So this patient, uh, as you're aware, has got um, an early relapse after completing maintenance therapy. Uh, by default, even at diagnosis, she was high risk acute lymphoblastic leukemia because on account of her presentation with hypodiploidy. Um, the presence of hypodiploidy in itself is a high risk indication, but if you notice, she had achieved uh, MRD negative status by the end of induction, and that is why high risk protocol was com uh, continued. But unfortunately, she relapsed before uh, just about two months after the end of maintenance therapy. So this takes us to a question as to what is the role of allogenic bone marrow transplants in today's date and age in acute lymphoblastic leukemia. So if you see uh, in general, the indication for allogenic bone marrow transplant in childhood acute lymphoblastic leukemia can broadly be classified into um, transplant in, in patients who are in CR1 or in more than CR1. When you say CR1, we mean patients in whom we are able to achieve a complete remission with primary therapy. So in such situations, allogenic transplant is indicated in patients who are either a hypodiploid acute lymphoblastic leukemia, a primary induction failure, which means that an induction therapy has not been successful in putting the patient into a remission by the end of phase one of induction. Another indication is in those patients who are slow responders in the sense that patients who achieve a remission 
but have slow response in the minimal or measurable residual disease at the end of induction or at the end of consolidation. Now, this is relevant because in certain situations like T-cell ALL, the response may be a little slow and time point two, that is at the end of consolidation, may be a better yardstick. But generally now, definitions have been revised and those patients who achieve remission but are still MRD positive automatically go into the high risk protocols involving more intensive chemotherapies with uh, keeping transplant as a backup. Now, this is an indication for transplant in CR1. There are certain subsets of ALLs in whom we may consider transplant upfront. Earlier, all TH positive acute lymphoblastic leukemias would be taken for a transplant. But now with the available availability of TKIs and as so lucidly explained by Dr. Lee, the availability of newer TKIs like the satinib have achieved deeper remissions and those patients in whom MRD is negative at the end of induction or by the end of 12 to 15 weeks of therapy, there may be a group of patients in whom they, there is no need for an allogenic bone marrow transplant. So that is the setting in which we offer allogenic transplant in patients who are de novo high risk because of their cytogenetics or because of the way they respond to treatment. The second set is a group of patients in whom the initial treatment is successful, but they relapse. Now, what is a relapse? Relapse could be an early relapse, a very early relapse, or a late relapse. A very early relapse is when relapse occurs before 18 months of, uh, from diagnosis and within six months of stopping uh, maintenance therapy. Whereas early bone marrow relapse is after 18 months of from diagnosis. Now in early relapses, if the patient has a bone marrow relapse, they tend to do well with an allogenic bone marrow transplant and their cure rates are reasonably good. In patients in whom there are isolated extramedullary relapse, which are early, they also need an allogenic transplant. When there is a late relapse and patients receive reinduction, but they don't go into a MRD negative remission, they are definitely a group of patients in whom transplant has to be offered. Any patient with T-cell ALL, relapsed T-cell ALL and relapsed pH positive ALLs are always high risk and need consolidation allogenic bone marrow transplant. Any relapses beyond CR2 are also an indication for transplant. Now, over a period of time, the indication of allogenic bone marrow transplant has been shrinking significantly. And with the advent of newer therapies, like the immunotherapies that we have, or that was discussed by Dr. Lee, like blenatumumab, inotuzumab, and CAR T cell therapy, that space is shrinking. But still, we are looking at indications for a transplant because some of these immunotherapies are not known to cause sustained duration of remission. And they may need to be consolidated with a allogenic bone marrow transplant in the setting of relapsed acute lymphoblastic leukemias. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Vivek. That was a nice uh, sum up of uh, indications for transplant in pediatric ALL. So uh, the next question to is, uh, could you take us through what are the different stages of uh, transplant? How do you take a patient through transplant? So once an indication has been decided, usually it is done by a multidisciplinary team of physicians, which includes the pediatric hematologists, as well as the transplant physicians, and everybody involved in the patient's care, once the decision is made, 
the patient is counseled and we do what is known as the HLA testing of the patient and then we begin to look for donors. Now, an allogenic bone marrow transplant means a HLA identical donor who may be a full matched or a haplo identical, that is half matched donor. Now, this donor may be within the family. There could be a sibling who is fully matched. The chance of a sibling being fully matched is about 25%. And with the number of siblings, uh, the chances are higher. So this is probably one clinical speciality where we hope and search that if the child had more siblings. So a sibling who is matched, in supposing we don't have a fully matched donor, we then start looking for matched donors outside the family in the sense that matched unrelated donor uh, registries are contacted. So there are registries in India there are registries worldwide where we can apply with the HLA test report of the patient to look for matched unrelated donors. Supposing we don't find matched unrelated donors, an equally efficacious way of looking for a donor is to look for half-matched or haplo-identical donors. So HLA cross-matching is a key step in identifying the donor. So once we know that there is a suitable donor, which is a matched sibling or a matched related person or a matched unrelated donor or a haploidentical donor, we initiate the pre-transplant workup after counseling the patient. Once the patient is found fit to undergo transplant, as well as the donor is identified, donor undergoes pre-transplant workup, then we do what is known as ID workup to look at infectious diseases profile in the patient, in the donor, which includes beyond the blood-borne viral diseases, we also look for CMV and in occasions HSV also, and to look whether the patient and donors are matched on this account, because we then have to be prepared for uh, infections post-transplant. Now, once the donor workup is complete, the donor is mobilized and his cells are collected. Simultaneously, the patient is also admitted into the bone marrow transplant unit for what is known as conditioning therapy. Now, a conditioning therapy means uh, a therapy that is basically given to the patient to eliminate any residual cancer cell. That is one purpose. The second purpose is to create space in the bone marrow by eliminating any residual bone marrow cells that are present in the donor. So now a conditioning therapy can be a total body irradiation based therapy or a combination of total body irradiation with chemotherapy or a irradiation free that is chemotherapy only myeloablative conditioning. Now, in many, paper, in many uh, studies, it has been proven that a total body irradiation-based therapy is what is recommended in patients with acute lymphoblastic leukemia. We'll be discussing that in the next slide. Now, as the patient gets conditioning therapy, a matched sibling or a haploidentical related donor also undergoes mobilization. Now, what is mobilization? Most transplant centers today use peripheral blood stem cell products. That means the patient, the donor is mobilized by giving them growth factors by what we all know is uh, GCSF, that is granulocyte colony stimulating factor over four days. And on the fifth day, once the patient's neutrophil counts and stem cell counts, I'm sorry, the donor's uh, neutrophil counts and stem cell counts go up. On the fifth day, the uh, peripheral blood is subjected to effervescence where a stem cell product is collected. Now, in the setting of a related donor, conditioning, mobilization, and collection all occur concurrently. But in the case of matched unrelated donors, in most settings, it 
can occur concurrently, but there are settings where a matched unrelated donor may be collected earlier, the product may be cryopreserved, and then the conditioning is started. So once the patient completes conditioning, we always count the days in reverse. Generally, the conditioning therapy is almost seven to eight days long for the fractionated courses of total body radiation, starting from day minus eight. And the day of infusion is called as day zero. So on day zero, the patient receives the infusion and then we wait for this. Once a myeloablated patient receives the stem cell infusion, what? I'm sorry about the background noise. I'm still in the hospital. Okay, the stem cell infusion, uh, once the stem cell infusion is received, the time taken for engraftment is about two to three weeks depending on the type of donor. Match sibling donors generally engraft a little earlier than match unrelated donors and haploidentical donors. So once the patient engrafts and he is stable and has no signs of other um, regimen related complications or transplant related complications, the patient is so the next slide, the next slide, we will talk about what are the common uh, issues related to a transplant. Now, an allogenic bone marrow transplant, the fundamental basis is not just elimination of the residual cancer cells by chemotherapy and replacement of the marrow with a healthy bone marrow but also that the new set of healthy cells that enters the patient's body are capable of recognizing the tumor cells as abnormal and eliminating them through the activation of the donor's T cells, which is called as the graft versus tumor effect or the graft versus leukemia effect, wherein the T cells of the donor responds to the foreign cancer cell and controls it. Now, what goes hand in hand with graft versus tumor effect is the ability of the T cells, of the same T cells, to identify every other cell of the recipient as alien and cause what is known as graft versus host disease. Now, graft versus host disease can affect the fast turnover cells commonly, especially the skin, the intestine, and the liver. Now, in uh, so it can be a skin, gra skin graft versus host disease, a liver graft versus host disease, or a gut graft versus host disease, which happens common. But technically, most sites can be affected by a graft versus host disease. When it happens by convention, uh, not by any specific biology, by convention, if it happens in the first 100 days, it's called as acute graft versus host disease. And if it happens after 100 days, it's called as chronic graft versus host disease. There are overlap syndromes. That's why I said that 100 days is generally a matter of convention. Now, acute graft versus host disease are generally a little more difficult to manage, but there is also data to say that patients who develop graft versus host disease within 55 days may have better outcomes. But so is also the case that patients who have controlled chronic graft versus host disease have also got better outcomes because they are possibly surrogates to the fact that graft versus leukemia effects may also may be, be happening in the patient's body simultaneously. In the next slide, we'll be talking, I briefly mentioned about conditioning regimens and what is the principle of conditioning regimens. I also mentioned about the type of conditioning regimens as total body irradiation based regimens and chemotherapy only regimens or a combination of the two. But it has been proven reasonably 
for a long time that total body irradiation based regimens function better in uh, childhood acute lymphoblastic leukemia because it is capable of covering these sanctuary sites better than chemotherapy especially cns and where there is a blood tissue barrier so a total body irradiation even today is the chosen modality of myeloablative conditioning unless the patient has other contraindications to receive total body irradiation based regimens thank you uh, dr vivek uh, that was uh, we, we have a lot of questions to ask you but i think we don't have uh, too much time left so we will wind up this session and uh, proceed to the next talk thank you dr vivek um uh, dr raghu thank you uh, thank you dr vivek it was a beautiful presentation on uh, the bone marrow transplant in this in this particular situation i uh, think we we have we don't have much time left so i think we'll go on to question answers and uh, and then uh, uh, during the question answer we can uh, you know those who have not spoken can uh, uh, and then we'll have the quiz because we are short we are uh, over, over short time quite a bit uh dr uh dr lee what is your overall impression of the uh, session and uh, what, what is your uh, your remarks regarding what what we have deliberated today dr lee are you there well i i don't think dr lee is there anymore <laughs> anyway so the the questions are i'm, I'm here yeah yeah so can you can you give an overview and what is the uh, has the has the need for bone marrow transplant sort of reduced like what vivek is saying after all the new new therapies have come about what is your uh, experience i think it is actually uh, something uh, very exciting nowadays when they are allow the new some form of new treatment that may be having a quite effective uh, curative uh, potential for example the car t cells that uh, in the past uh, people will be using that as a last resort that means uh, after repeated relapses or we refractory disease and then uh, will consider, consider giving uh, car t now uh, but nowadays people consider that some patients that may potentially uh, can be uh, cured by these uh, less a uh, toxic treatment as compared to bone marrow transplant uh, but this is still quite preliminary and uh, so that is why uh, in some studies they are now uh, conducting uh, some form of studies to test the uh, um the role of uh, this uh, car t or other forms of new treatments uh, in the uh, 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 in the place of uh, high risk or relapsed patients to see whether they can replace stem cell transplant uh, even for for doing stem cell transplant for uh, this relapse uh, leukemia uh, the success rate uh, is not very high uh, most uh, studies coming about 60 to 70% or or at most uh, 75% so uh, these treatment uh, have been used for a long time so that we also have uh, more data on the long term follow up of the survivors and we we are seeing uh, some of these patients are uh, uh, having unfortunately having uh, chronic GHD that have a quite poor quality of life uh, we have some patients lost due to lung GHD that could not be salvaged with a very intensive immunosuppressive or more Uh, 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 unfortunate that they may even develop second cancers. So I I think this is uh, some we are now at the time of uh, having some new treatments, uh, providing hope for less uh, toxic treatment and uh, maybe more effective treatment. But uh, that require more studies to confirm their role. If uh, for these patients, uh, I think if you don't have these kind of new treatment that. I, uh stem cell transplant probably will still be uh the the best option uh do you think the survival can improve from 90% to any any further with this new treatment uh 
Now, once a disease that achieves 90% chance of cure, uh, the uh, further improvement is usually quite difficult because even two or 3% improvement is already very significant in this setting. And uh, so we, we, of course, we hope that we can achieve 95% or 98%, but uh, I, I think that will take a long time to, that, uh, to get to that point. Uh, Dr. Raku, you uh, presented a, a beautiful case. What is, if suppose only single line is, when you're, when you're presenting, the case presents with only a single line being affected, what is the chance of that child having leukemia? Like only, if only the platelets are down, what percentage of those children could uh, land up uh, with a leukemia? Yeah, so um, there is one of the indicators that the myelosuppression has affected all cell lines. That's my hemoglobin dropping, uh, total counts are dropping or uh, increasing leukocytosis and the platelets are dropping. This indicates that all three cell lines are affected. That is more in favor of a leukemia. But many cases can present with, present with isolated uh, cell lane suppression uh, or um, isolated leukocytosis initially sometimes. But that alone will not say that this is not looking. So you have to look at the child uh, more holistically. You have to look at the clinical presentation, other uh, symptoms. Actually, Dr. Guru Prasad that started off his presentation with the clinical history and examination. All these things put together will give us uh, an information rather than looking at a single cell line. Yes. Thrombocytopenia okay. alone can also present with, uh, I mean, maybe a presenting sign of um, leukemia, but in general, um, it, it, it affects to, it tends to affect all, all cell lines. Get, what is the is, chances of, yeah, you know, if you want to say something? Yeah, Jason, so, see, remember, you, you may have a patient with a CBC showing, apparently looks like an ITP or a low platelet, but if you carefully look at his absolute neutrophil count, you know, you'll have some borderline low ANC, past, if you see CBC done some time back, definitely had a low NC, then it will recover, or oh, hemoglobin is borderline low. Something is always there. I mean, to have a pure ITP-like presentation with only low platelet in an acute setting is very unlikely. In fact, most of the Western countries, they would not say to do a bone marrow in an ITP child. But in our country, where the CBCs are not done always by the best pathologist, I would say that we must see our own smear. If it's a smear, you have no blast at all. You have done one or two CBCs. And they are all clean and okay, and there is no organomegaly in an otherwise well looking child, then virtually it results a malignancy as the cause. So, I think uh, many times you see he presented as ITP and turned out to leukemia, but he always had some feature at least, if not full blown. Okay, the next question is to anyone who can answer is about Down syndrome and leukemia. Uh, there's a question on uh, what, what is the, the chances of uh, uh, recovery of children, children with Down syndrome and leukemia? Is it a good better prognosis? What is there a treatment change? Do they go on the transplant? What is uh, your uh, experience? Um, may, may I talk about this topic? Uh, now for uh, Down syndrome with ALL, in general, their prognosis is not as good as other normal children, mainly because of two reasons. Num number one is that they have a, a less favorable uh, factors for example, they, are, they have less chance of having tail AML1 or hyperdiploidy. So their uh, uh, biological features are more unfavorable. Number two, these patients are having uh, uh, more treatment toxicity and the treatment related mortality is higher, especially they cannot tolerate the high dose methotrexate. So nowadays people are doing some uh, clinical trial. At the moment, we are also working with Japan, Singapore uh, on a joint uh, clinical trial, uh, testing a protocol which is uh, using a lower dose of uh, methotrexate, but with adjustment according to their tolerance and also monitor according to the MRD. And uh, now if this uh, Down syndrome with a good response to initial treatment with MRD, Turn negative, and uh, their long-term prognosis is still uh, reasonably good. So uh, for these patients, the main objective is not to uh, kill these patients with uh, a toxic treatment. So uh, for example, for methotrexate, sage, we start with 500 milligram per meter square uh, initially, rather than using those uh, three gram or, or five gram that they may not be able to tolerate. 
And then um, with these uh, good MLD responders, uh, the long-term survival is still good. We, we have some Down syndrome who are now already 20, 30 years after uh, the initial diagnosis. But they, of course, they have other uh, 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 medical morbidities due to the down, underlying Down syndrome. However, uh, if they have a poor response uh, to the uh, initial treatment with high MLD, whether we should go for transplant, I, I think that is a more complicated issues than uh, a normal child going for stem cell transplant. And uh, because these patients uh, uh, will also have uh, more toxicities from the conditioning. So that is something we have to be uh, bear in mind that uh, they uh, may not be able to uh, uh, go through the transplant course as smoothly. Thank you. Uh, Nitin, there's a question on, can you get tumor lysis before you start treatment? You can have tumor lysis at present. Syndrome yes. before you start treatment? Yes, of course they can have. They, if children will come with very high tumor load or they come with a, a very high WBC count, they can have tumor lysis at presentation. There's no problem. I mean, they can come. No, when you have a tumor lysis, they have, they have uh, lymphoma you know, or a leukemia, like a Burkitt's. Many times they are present straight with puffiness, oliguria, and besides the malignancy. How do you decide the what the reason for the coma is? Coma is you have to. Yeah, all these and... conditions can cause coma. How do you how That's do you decide right. which is the most? It could be multiple causes in a, in a. Yeah, how do you decide which is the most prominent? Yeah. How do you treat? Generally, any malignancy which has a significant CNS toxicity, besides the neurological consult, you will always do an imaging and a CSF, and you will find that what is, what is it. If you see blast cells in the CSF, you know it's because of the CNS leukemia. Generally, they don't come comatose. They may have electrolyte encephalopathy, BUN, creatinine, liver disorder, so many other causes of encephalopathy. And of course, patients who have received high dose methotrexate, it can be because of the methotrexate induced uh, toxicity. Uh, if you've done an ITM, there can be an aseptic meningitis. So you can't just uh, one uh, shoes put fit all type of approach. Uh, shall we go on to the quiz? Is this the time for quiz, Amod? There are a lot of questions on the on the chat box. I think if uh, each of you can answer those, uh, uh, there's one on MRT platforms, very standardized and validated for cytometry-based versus PCR-based. Data from most PCR-based uh, MRT studies. What, what is the uh, uh, what, what are they talking about? MRT platforms that they vary, and uh, you know what? What is the uh, difference? Uh, sir, I have already asked the um, on the all the faculty to answer the queries on the chat box itself. So. Yeah. We can I think, have the I think so there's so many questions. I, I can't take up these questions because there are about 10 or 20 questions on the chat box. So Sir, we, they, still, we still have 58 participants, so I think they're ready for the quiz. Okay, and we'll start the quiz. We'll have the quiz, and then if possible, if there's time, we'll do the questions. Can, can uh, Raku, are you sharing the slide of the quiz? Raku? Uh, uh, you can start sharing the slides, sir. What's happening? Well, it's been a long session, and uh, I. Hey, I'm only getting his share. Do you have the uh, slides with you, Raghu? Yes, I just hold on. So for the quest, the participants are expected to put the question number in numerical and the an answer in alphabet and post it on the chat box. And the first 
correct person on the chat box will be considered and the final uh, tally will be taken and then the winner will be announced at the last question Are you, are you able to share? Yeah, I'm, I'm just uh, getting it ready. Yeah. Uh, by the way, if this time, uh, can we, can someone answer what are the long term complications that you expect in ALL? How oh, we started? We are starting. Okay. The first question is, which one of the following is considered as a favorable risk factor in ALL? Option 1, ATV6 run X1, 2, IAM21, 3, hypodiploidy, 4, translocation 8, 21. Which one is considered a favorable risk factor in ALL? Most of the options or the most of the questions have already been discussed by various speakers. We kept it very simple. Everyone's got that right. Everyone has got the answer right. Okay. Okay, uh, next, next. Dr. Regu, we have a problem. We have the question and the answer in numerical. Uh, uh, no, okay, it's okay, it's okay. Let's, let's uh, do this. Okay, next. The second question is, which one is not a feature of tumor lysis syndrome? Options are hyperkalemia, hypercalcemia, hyperphosphatemia, hyperuricemia. Which one is not a feature of tumor lysis syndrome? Okay, next one. Everyone's got that right too. Okay. So good to hear that everyone has been listening. Question number three, which was the first documented bona fide genetic signature of a malignancy? That is, which was the first genetic characteristic genetic feature, which was described to be associated with a malignancy. Translocation 922, ATV6 run X1, hyperdiploidy, hypodiploidy. Everyone's got that right too. Okay. <laughs> so the Philadelphia chromosome or translocation 922 was the first uh, genetic abnormal to just... Okay, uh, next. Question number four. Which is the characteristic immunophenotype feature of a blast in precursor B cell ALL? Is it CD20, CD10, CD3 or myeloperoxidase? Only one wrong, all the rest right. Yeah? Okay. <laughs> okay, next. I hope that's CD10, the or, or, common uh, atelophoblastic leukemia antigen, Kala positive cells are characteristic. Question number five Which one of the following drugs used in ALL is associated with increased risk of cerebral vein thrombosis? L asparaginase, citrabine, imatinib, donorubicin. Okay, the answer. Answer is L asparaginase. Everyone's got that right too. Which one of the following is not ideal as a single agent antibiotic for the management of neutropenic fever? Single agent antibiotic. Is it ceftazidine, ceftriaxone, meropenem, or cefepime? Some differences here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. okay. I think uh, Nitin has uh, mentioned all this. Yeah. yeah. So uh, the answer to this is uh, ceftriaxone, since uh, it doesn't have anti pseudomonal coverage. So as a single agent, it is not ideal. So some have got it wrong here. Okay. 
which one of the following is not a chemotherapy drug associated with cardiotoxicity? Donorubicin, mitosantron, adarubicin, citrabin. Okay, next one. Yeah, the answer to that is... Almost cyclic. all have got it right. So all the, other, all the other drugs are anthracyclines with varying uh, degree or varying incidence of cardiotoxicity. Cytrabin doesn't cause. Which drug is used for central nervous system prophylaxis in ALL? There is some ambiguity in the second choice. So first is cyclophosphamide, doxorubicin, methotrexate. Okay, there's one person who's uh, given cytorabin, so I think uh, yes. we're finishing. Yeah. So, uh, cytorabin up front, uh, ALL, actually cytorabin is not used. In this <laughs> case, if it relapses, cytorabin is used. But uh, in general, up front ALL treatment, methotrexate is the drug which is uh, commonly used nowadays as CNS prophylaxis. But for triple, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Question number nine, which one of the following uh, converts uric acid into a water-soluble form? Allopurinol, rasburicase, febuxistat, all of the above. Good. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, and most of them have got that right. Yeah. So it is rasburicus, it is converted to, <laughs> is converted to alantoin, which is a, a water soluble form and can be excreted. All uh, other two blocks the formation of uric acid. The last question, which is not true late medullary relapses do not always need HSCT. Isolated CNS relapse has a poorer outcome than medullary relapse. Early medullary relapses have better outcomes uh, with transplant. Minimal residual disease status is useful in uh, prognosticating HCT outcome. Which is not true. Amazing. Most of them have got it right. Okay, that's fantastic. Uh, then we have to finish. Also, better outcome than uh, the fellows. Uh, last last question. Excellent quiz, uh, Raghu. I think uh, that uh, boys have the children have done quite well. Uh, can we have the uh, winner? So, Jason, it means that those who have stayed back for the quiz were really attentive throughout the session. Yeah, you have hundred people. Hundred people yeah. in the in the meeting, and maybe more on YouTube. Yeah, it's just fantastic at ten o'clock in the night to listen to all of you. If there are hundred people meeting for two hours, huh? it good. shows uh, the quality of the of the program. Doctor Jason, yeah. sir. Yeah. We will have the quiz answers in a minute. So, in case there is any other uh, question which can be answered in the meanwhile, maybe in like two minutes, we can take that up right now. Yeah. Uh, uh, what is the role of exposure of, uh, to ABV? Does it cause B cell ill? What is the, what is the status now? Is um, uh, ABV a cause for... Uh, is exposure to ABV, does it produce ALL? No. I don't think there is evidence that uh, 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 ABV will be leading to ALL. Uh, except for uh, the uh, Burkitt lymphoma that have uh, more strong evidence. Okay. Next is, so wh what are the long-term complications? What all do you look for when you follow up these patients who have, who have uh, recovered? What all do you expect? What, wh when do you do your uh, uh, assessments and uh, what do you expect? What are the complications? 
Uh, essentially, all patients uh, who have completed treatment uh, for ALL need to be on a long-term follow-up plan, which has to be clearly charted at the end of treatment and has to be meticulously followed. So basically, it depends on what kind of treatment the child has received, uh, what were the complications during the uh, treatment, and the uh, intensity of the treatment, whether the child had a relapse and was treated again with, with uh, relapse protocol and transplant. All these things will matter when we take uh, this into consideration. So it can affect multiple systems, mainly uh, cardiotoxicity due to anthracyclines, which is fortunately coming down because of the risk stratified approach. Then uh, radiation therapy is another risk factor again, which is now uh, falling into um, disuse because of adequate uh, chemotherapy and risk stratification. Endocrinology issues uh, can occur because of high dose steroids that are used due to the cranial radiotherapy, which is, do, which is given uh, due to the transplant related complication. Uh, patients can have growth issues uh, because of um, steroid use again, um, again due to radiotherapy and intense chemotherapy. All these things can uh, cause cumulative toxicity in multiple organs. So each of these has to be uh, identified and regularly screened for as per a defined protocol for each of these patients. I would just uh, we'll add to consciously um, say in a uh, few minutes actually. I would just add to say that uh, a vascular necrosis of femur, sometimes you can see because of steroid use, we have had children, they needed hip replacement when they grew. Then yes. most important is the psychological and the social issues, schooling, late uh, up, marriage of a child survivor, his job, uh, what, what job he can do. Some of them have some cognitive dysfunction, no matter what we say. And uh, so these are the other issues that, you know, finding out. What about sterility? Uh, Yes, in yes, infertility is also an issue, um, especially when we are using oxysophorins, uh, ifosfamide and uh, cyclophosphamide, mm -hmm. and also testicular radiation or uh, total body radiation during transplant. But in the upfront treatment, infertility is not that much of a risk because we use uh, quite a low dose of uh, cyclophosphamide. Mm -hmm. Ifosfamide is hardly ever used in the current protocols. It's mainly a problem when you are dealing with uh, relapses and... Uh, Patients. Dr. Lee, what is the chances of uh, other uh, malignancies and uh, these children? Uh, for the chance of second malignancy depends very much on what kind of treatment they have received. Hey, if they, they have uh, received a cranial irradiation as prophylaxis, certainly these patients are at high chance. And also if they have received a high dose of atopocyte or cyclophosphamide, they, these are also the risk factors. It can be up to 10% over 20 to 30 years of follow-up. However, with our current uh, treatment protocol, actually the chance of second malignancy is much lower, will be less than 5% in uh, over 10 to 20 years. Uh, but these are now uh, having a problem of, um, of a, a, some kind of germline mutation that may predispose these patients to have second malignancy. So that nowadays in the long-term follow-up uh, clinic, I always uh, uh, discuss with the uh, survivors about the uh, ways to reduce, uh, to uh, decrease the chance of uh, developing sand cancer. For example, avoiding smoking, avoiding uh, alcohol, uh, vaccinations uh, to prevent uh, some kind of preventable cancers and also uh, to have the healthy lifestyle, decrease the uh, meat intake, reduce the chance of colon cancer, etc. So we, we have to be more uh, uh, active to uh, advise the patients to have uh, measures uh, to uh, avoid the second cancer. What is uh, transient leukemia? Is it have, a... You mean the leukemia as a second uh, cancer? Transient uh, leukemia, it... transient leukemia. You know, you have these newborns uh, for some time. They transient myeloproliferative. Yeah, yeah, that's it. The Downs uh, uh, transient myeloproliferative uh, disease, they will be having, after their recovery, there will be about 10% chance that this, uh, for example, the Down syndrome will ultimately develop uh, uh, the acute leukemia. But these are usually the AML. Yeah. Uh, can we have the winner of the quiz? Um, promote An important long term issue is metabolic complications. That's yeah, can you can you elaborate? Most most of the very long survivors 
are having um, this metabolic syndrome. Uh, most of the long term, very long term surveys of leukemia on follow up usually have the metabolic syndrome, which includes lipid issues, lipid profile issues, hypertension, things like that. Ramo, do we have a, a winner? Yeah, Dr. Narendra is the winner. I request him to put your uh, mobile number and place of work on the chat box so that we can send you the certificates. Uh, congratulations, Dr. Narendra. Uh, Dr. Lee, Dr. Guru Prasad, Dr. Raghu, Dr. Vivek, and Dr. Nitin. Please, uh, we must congratulate Dr. Narendra. This, almost all the students did a very good job on the quiz. Uh, Nathan, you were following the quiz. You answered. Narendra yes. is student. <laughs> Where? At uh, RCC? No, no, no. <laughs> no Narendra is from Bhuvaneshwar Ames, right? Bhuvaneshwar Ames. He is an uh, assistant professor or probably associate professor. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> yeah. See, most of the quizzes were won by game students. You know, so far all the quizzes game students. You know. Okay. Uh, Narendra is a good friend of mine. Yeah. I'm not excellent. A so, uh, a concluding remark from uh, uh, um, Dr. Lee before we uh, have the vote of thanks from uh, our uh, uh, secretary. Yeah, uh, uh, actually, thank you for inviting me joining this uh, session. I enjoy very much because uh, there are so many experts, uh, uh, speakers, talk, sharing their experience and also uh, pointing out the important points in the management of uh, acute lymphoblastic leukemia. I believe uh, the attendance will certainly benefit a lot from uh, the knowledge transfer to and also the experience sharing in this uh, excellent section. And uh, congratulations for uh, having such an a, a excellent program uh, as a continuous uh, medical education uh, for colleagues working in the field. Thank you again. Thank you so much, Dr. Lee. Thank you. I request uh, uh, the word of thanks from the IP Press Secretary. Um, uh, good evening, all. Uh, hope all you enjoyed today's knowledge feast. Uh, I would like to thank uh, to our eminent speakers, Dr. Chikong Lee, Dr. Nitin Shah, Dr. Rekhu, Dr. Vivek Radhakrishnan, and uh, Dr. Guru Prasad. And my sincere thanks to our moderator, Dr. Jason Sir, and uh, our IAP coaching president, uh, Dr. Pramod Vaidya. And uh, thank you all the uh, uh, participants and uh, hope all you enjoyed. Thank you, good night. That was our secretary, Dr. Sajid. I forgot to introduce him. Dr. Sajid is our secretary. Please raise your hands. Sajid, you're doing a great job. Okay. So thank you so much, everybody. We'll see you, keep, keep in touch. Yeah. Thank okay. You. Thank you. Good, night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thank Bye. you. It must be twelve thirty, yeah. Doctor Lee, at your yeah. place. Yeah, it's twelve thirty. <laughs> Good night. <laughs> Thank you so much for being with us. Good night. Bye. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Good night.